Chapter 8 from The Sane Society by Eric Fromm. Chapter 8 is called Roads to Sanity. This is uh, the first part of three parts for Chapter 8 because it is long. General, general Considerations In the various critical analyses of capitalism, we find remarkable agreement while it is true that the capitalism of the 19th century was criticized for its neglect of the material welfare of the workers, this was never the main criticism. What Owen and Proudhon, Tolstoy and Bakunin, Durkheim and Marx, Einstein and Schweitzer talk about is man and what happens to him in our industrial system. Although they express it in different concepts, they all find that man has lost his central place that he has been made an instrument for the purposes of economic aims, that he has been estranged from and has lost the concrete relatedness to his fellow men and to nature, that he has ceased to have a meaningful life. I have tried to express the same idea by elaborating on the concept of alienation and by showing psychologically what the psychological results of alienation are, that man regresses to a receptive and marketing orientation and ceases to be productive, that he loses his sense of self, becomes dependent on approval, hence tends to conform and yet to feel insecure. He is dissatisfied, bored, and anxious, and spends most of his energy in the attempt to compensate for or just to cover up this anxiety. His intelligence is excellent, his reason deteriorates, and in view of his technical powers, he is seriously endangering the existence of civilization, and even of the human race. If we turn to views about the causes for this development, we find less agreement than in the diagnosis of the illness itself. While the early 19th century was still prone to see the causes of all evil and the lack of political freedom, and especially of universal suffrage, the socialists, and especially the Marxists, stressed the significance of economic factors. They believed that the alienation of man resulted from his role as an object of exploitation and use. Thinkers like Tolstoy and Burkhart, on the other hand, stressed the spiritual and moral impoverishment as the cause of Western man's decay. Freud believed that modern man's trouble was the over-repression of his instinctual drives and the resulting neurotic manifestations. But any explanation which analyzes one sector to the exclusion of others is unbalanced and thus wrong. The socioeconomic, spiritual, and psychological explanations look at the same phenomenon from different aspects, and the very task of a theoretical analysis is to see how these different aspects are interrelated and how they interact. What holds true for the causes holds, of course, true for the remedies by which modern man's defect can be cured. If I believe that the cause of the illness is economic or spiritual or psychological, I necessarily believe that remedying the cause leads to sanity. On the other hand, if I see how the various aspects are interrelated, I shall arrive at the conclusion that sanity and mental health can be attained only by simultaneous changes in the sphere of industrial and political organization of spiritual and philosophical orientation, of character structure, and of cultural activities. The concentration of effort in any of these spheres to the exclusion or neglect of others is destructive of all change. In fact, here seems to lie one of the most important obstacles to the progress of mankind. Christianity has preached spiritual renewal, neglecting the changes in the social order without which spiritual renewal must remain ineffective for the majority of people. The age of enlightenment has postulated as the highest norms independent judgment and reason. It preached political equality without seeing that political equality could not lead to the realization of the brotherhood of man if it was not accompanied by a fundamental change in the social economic organization. Socialism, and especially Marxism, has stressed the necessity for social and economic changes and neglected the necessity of the inner change in human beings, without which economic change can never lead to the good society. Each of these great reform movements of the last 2,000 years has emphasized one sector of life to the exclusion of the others. 
The proposals for reform and renewal were radical, but the results were almost complete failure. The preaching of the gospel led to the establishment of the Catholic Church. The teachings of the rationalists of the 18th century to Robespierre and Napoleon. The doctrines of Marx to Stalin. The results could hardly have been different. Man is a unit. His thinking, feeling, and his practice of life are inseparably connected. He cannot be free in his thought when he is not free emotionally, and he cannot be free emotionally if he is dependent and unfree in his practice of life, in his economic and social relations. Trying to advance radically in one sector to the exclusion of others must necessarily lead to the result to which it did lead, namely that the radical demands in one sphere are fulfilled only by a few individuals, while for the majority they become formulae and rituals, serving to cover up the fact that in other spheres nothing has changed. Undoubtedly, one step of integrated progress in all spheres of life will have more far-reaching and more lasting results for the progress of the human race than a hundred steps preached, and even for a short while lived, in only one isolated sphere. Several thousands of years of failure and isolated progress should be a rather convincing lesson. Closely related to this problem is that of radicalism and reform, which seems to form such a dividing line between various political solutions. Yet a closer analysis can show that this differentiation, as it, as it is usually conceived of, is deceptive. There is reform and reform. Reform can be radical, that is, going to the roots, or it can be superficial, trying to patch up symptoms without touching the causes. Reform which is not radical in this sense never accomplishes its ends and eventually ends up in the opposite direction. So-called radicalism, on the other hand, which believes that we can solve problems by force when observation, patience, and continuous activity is required, is as unrealistic and fictitious as reform. Historically speaking, they both often lead to the same result. The revolution of the Bolsheviks led to Stalinism. The reform of the right-wing Social Democrats in Germany led to, her led to Hitler. The true criterion of reform is not its tempo, but its realism, its true radicalism. It is the question whether it goes to the roots and attempts to change causes, or whether it remains on the surface and attempts to deal only with symptoms. If this chapter is to discuss roads to sanity, that is, methods of cure, we had better pause here for a moment and ask ourselves what we know about the nature of cure in cases of individual mental diseases. The cure of social pathology must follow the same principle, since it is the pathology of so many human beings and not of an entity beyond or apart from individuals. The conditions for the cure of individual pathology are mainly the following. 1. A development must have occurred which is contrary to the proper functioning of the psyche. In Freud's theory, this means that the libido has failed to develop normally and that, as a result, symptoms are produced. In the frame of reference of humanistic psychoanalysis, the causes of pathology lie in the failure to develop a productive orientation, a failure which results in the development of irrational passions, especially of incestuous destructive and exploitative strivings. The fact of suffering, whether it is conscious or unconscious, resulting from the failure or of normal development, produces a dynamic striving to overcome the suffering, that is, for change in the direction of health. This striving for health in our physical as well as in our mental organism is the basis for any cure of sickness, and it is absent only in the most severe pathology. Two, the first step necessary to permit this tendency for health to operate is the awareness of the suffering and of that which is shut out and dis disassociated from our conscious personality. In Freud's doctrine, repression refers mainly to sexual strivings. In our frame of reference, it refers to the repressed irrational passions, to the repressed feeling of aloneness and futility, and to the longing for love and productivity, which is also repressed. 3. Increasing self-awareness can become fully effective only if a next step is taken, that of changing practice of life which was built on the basis of the neurotic structure and which reproduces it constantly. 
A patient, for instance, whose neurotic character makes him want to submit to parental authorities, has usually constructed a life where he has chosen dominating or sadistic father images as bosses, teachers, and so on. He will be cured only if he changes his realistic life situation in such a way that he does not constantly reproduce the submissive tendencies he wants to give up. Furthermore, he must change his systems of values, norms, and ideals so that they further, rather than block, his striving for health and maturity. The same conditions conflict with the requirements of human nature and resulting suffering, awareness of what is shut out, and change of the realistic situation and of values and norms are also necessary for a cure of social pathology. To show the conflict between human needs and our social structure and to further the awareness of our conflicts and of that which is dissociated was the purpose of the previous chapter of this book, to discuss the various possibilities of practical changes in our economic, political, and cultural organization is the intention of this chapter. However, before we start discussing the practical questions, let us consider once more what, on the basis of the premises developed in the beginning of this book, constitutes mental sanity, and what type of culture could be assumed to be conducive to mental health. The mentally healthy person is the productive and unalienated person, the person who relates himself to the world lovingly, and he uses his reason to grasp reality objectively, who experiences himself as a unique individual entity, and at the same time feels one with his fellow man, who is not subject to a rational authority, and accepts willingly the rational authority of conscience and reason, who is in the process of being born as long as he is alive, and considers the gift of life the most precious chance he has. Let us also remember that these goals of mental health are not ideals which have to be forced upon the person, or which man can attain only if he overcomes his nature, and sacrifices his innate selfishness. On the contrary, the striving for mental health, for happiness, harmony, love, productiveness, is inherent in every human being who is not born as a mental or moral idiot, Given a chance, these strivings assert themselves forcefully, as can be seen in countless situations. It takes powerful constellations and circumstances to pervert and stifle this innate striving for sanity. And indeed, throughout the greater part of known history, the use of man by man has produced such perversion. To believe that this perversion is inherent in man is like throwing seeds in the soil of the desert, and claiming they were not meant to grow. What society corresponds to this aim of mental health, and what would be the structure of a sane society? First of all, a society in which no man is a means towards an another's ends, but always and without exception an end in himself. Hence, where nobody is used, nor uses himself for purposes which are not those of the unfolding of his own human powers, where man is the center and where all economic and political activities are subordinated to the aim of his growth. A sane society is one in which qualities like greed, exploited, exploitativeness, possessiveness, narcissism have no chance to be used for greater material gain or for the enhancement of one's personal prestige. Where acting according to one's conscience is looked upon as a fundamental and necessary quality, and where opportunism and lack of principles is deemed to be a social. Where the individual is concerned with social matters so that they become personal matters, where his relation to his fellow man is not separated from his relationship in the private sphere. A sane society, furthermore, is one which permits man to operate within manageable and observable dimensions and to be an active and responsible participant in the life of society, as well as the master of his own life. It is one which furthers human solidarity and not only permits, but stimulates its members to relate themselves to each other lovingly. A sane society furthers the productive activity of everybody in his work, stimulates the unfolding of reason, and enables man to give expression to his inner needs in collective art and rituals. Economic Transformation A. Socialism as a Problem 
We have discussed in the previous chapter the three answers to the problem of present-day insanity, those of totalitarianism, supercapitalism, and socialism. The totalitarian solution, be it of the fascist or Stalinist type, quite obviously leads only to increased insanity and dehumanization. The solution of supercapitalism only deepens the pathology which is inherent in capitalism. It increases man's alienation, his automized autom automatization, and completes the process of making him a servant to the idol of production. The only constructive solution is that of socialism, which aims at a fundamental reorganization of our economic and social system in the direction of freeing man from being used as a means for purposes outside of himself, of creating a social order in which human solidarity, reason, and productiveness are furthered rather than hobbled. Yet there can be no doubt that the results of socialism, where it has been practiced so far, have been at least disappointing. What are the reasons for this failure? What are the aims and goals of social and economic reconstruction which can avoid this failure and lead to a sane society? According to Marxist socialism, a socialist society was built on two premises, the socialization of the means of production and distribution, and a centralized and planned economy. Marx and the early socialists had no doubt that if these aims could be accomplished, the human emancipation of all men from alienation and a classless society of brotherliness and justice would follow almost automatically. All that was necessary for the human transformation was, as they saw it, that the working class gained political control, either by force or by ballot, socialized industry, and instituted a planned economy. The question whether they were right in their assumption is not an academic question anymore. Russia has done what the Marxist socialists thought was necessary to do in the economic sphere. While the Russian system showed that economically a socialized and planned economy can work efficiently, it proved that it is in no way a sufficient condition to create a free, brotherly, and unalienated society. On the contrary, it showed that centralized planning can even create a greater degree of regimentation and, then, and authoritarianism than is to be found in capitalism or in fascism. The fact, however, that a socialized and planned economy has been realized in Russia does not mean that the Russian system is the realization of socialism, as Marx and Engels understood it. It means that Marx and Engels were mistaken in thinking that legal change in ownership and a planned economy were sufficient to bring about the social and human changes desired by them. While socialization of the means of production in combination with a planned economy were the most central demands of Marxist socialism, there were some others which have completely failed to materialize in Russia. Marx did not postulate complete equality of income, but nevertheless had in mind a sharp reduction of inequality as it exists in capitalism. The fact is that inequality of income is much greater in Russia than in the United States or Britain. Another Marxist idea was that socialism would lead to the withering of the state and to the gradual disappearance of social classes. The fact is that the power of the state and the distinction between social classes are greater in Russia than in any capitalist country. Eventually, the center of Marx's concept of socialism was the idea that man, his emotional and intellectual powers, are the aim and goal of culture, that things, equal capital, must serve life, labor, and that life must not be subordinated to that which is dead. Here again, the disregard for the individual and his human qualities is greater in Russia than in any of the capitalist countries. But Russia was not the only country which tried to apply the economic concepts of Marxist socialism. The other country was Great Britain. Paradoxically enough, the Labour Party, which is not based on Marxist theory and its practical measures, followed exactly the path of Marxist doctrine, that the realization of socialism is based on the socialization of industry. The difference to Russia is clear enough. The British Labour Party always relied on peaceful means for the realization of its aims. Its policy was not based on an all-or-nothing demand, but made it possible to socialize medicine, banking, steel, mining, railroads, and the chemical industry without nationalizing the rest of British industry. But while it introduced an economy in which socialist elements were blended with capitalism, 
No. Nevertheless, the main idea for attaining socialism was that of socialization of the means of production. Oh, this is unfortunate. However, the British experiment, while less drastic in its failures, was also discouraging. On the one hand, it created a good deal of regimentation and bureaucratization, which did not endear it to anyone concerned with increase in human freedom and independence. <clears throat> On the other hand, it did not accomplish any of the basic expectations of socialism. It became quite clear that it made very little or no difference to a worker in the British mining or steel industry, whether the owner of the industry were a few thousand or even hundred thousand individuals, as in a public corporation or the state. His wages, rights, and most important of all, his conditions of work, his role in the process of work remained essentially the same. There are few advantages brought about by nationalization, which the worker could not have attained through his unions in a purely capitalist economy. On the other hand, while the main aim of socialism has not been fulfilled by the measures of the labor government, it would be short-sighted to ignore the fact that British socialism has brought about favorable changes of the utmost importance in the life of the British people. One is the extension of the social security system to health. That no person in Great Britain has to be afraid of illness as of a catastrophe which may completely disorganize his life, not to speak of the possibility of losing it for lack of proper medical care, may sound little to a member of the middle or upper classes of the United States who has no trouble paying the doctor's bill and hospitalization. But it is indeed a fundamental improvement to be compared to the progress made by the introduction of public education. It is furthermore true that the nationalization of industry, even to the limited degree that it was introduced in Britain, about one-fifth of the whole industry, permitted the state to regulate the total economy to a certain extent, a regulation from which the whole of the British economy profited. But with all respect and appreciation for the achievements of the Labour government, their measures were not conducive to the realization of socialism. If we take it in a human rather in a human rather than in a purely economic sense. And if one were to argue that the Labour Party only began with the realization of its program, and that it would have introduced socialism if it had been in power long enough to complete its work, such argument is not very convincing. Even visualizing the socialization of the whole of British heavy industry, one can see greater security, greater prosperity, and one need not be afraid that the new bureaucracy would be more dangerous to freedom than the bureaucracy of General Motors or General Electric. But in spite of all that could be said about its advantages, such socialization and planning would not be socialism. If we mean by it a new form of life, a society of solidarity and faith, in which the individual has found himself and has emerged from the alienation inherent in the capitalistic system. The terrifying result of Soviet communism on the one hand, the disappointing results of Labour Party socialism on the other, has led to a mood of resignation and hopelessness among many democratic socialists. Some still go on believing in socialism, but more out of pride or stubbornness than out of real conviction. Others, busy with smaller or bigger tasks in one of the socialist parties, do not reflect too much and find themselves satisfied with the practical activities at hand. Still others, who have lost faith in a renewal of society, consider it their main task to lead the crusade against Russian communism, while they reiterate the charges against communism, well known and accepted by anybody who is not a Stalinist. They refrain from any radical criticism of capitalism and from any new proposals for the functioning of democratic socialism. They give the impression that everything is all right with the world, if only it can be saved from the communist threat. They act like disappointed lovers who have lost all faith in love. As one symptomatic expression of the general discouragement among democratic socialists, I quote from an article by R. H. S. Crossman, one of the most thoughtful and active leaders of the left wing of the Labour Party. Living in an age not of steady progress towards a world welfare capitalism, Crossman writes, but of world revolution, it is folly for us to assume that the socialist's task is to assist in the gradual improvement of the material lot of the human race, 
and the gradual enlargement of the area of human freedom. The forces of history are all pressing toward totalitarianism. In the Russian bloc, owing to the conscious policy of the Kremlin, in the free world, owing to the growth of the, of the managerial society, the effects of total rearmament and the repression of colonial aspirations. The task of socialism is neither to accelerate this political revolution nor to oppose it. This would be as futile as opposition to the industrial revolution a hundred years ago, but to civilize it. It appears to me that Crossman's pessimism leads to two errors. One is the assumption that managerial or Stalinist totalitarianism can be civilized. If by civilized is meant a less cruel system than that of Stalinist dictatorship, Crossman may be right, but the version of the brave new world which rests entirely on suggestion and conditioning is as inhuman and as insane as Orwell's version of 1984. Neither version of a completely alienated society can be humanized. The other error lies in Crossman's pessimism itself. Socialism and its genuine human and moral aspirations is still a potent aim of many millions all over the world, and the objective conditions for humanistic democratic socialism are more given today than in the 19th century. The reasons for this assumption are implicit in the following attempt to outline some of the proposals for a socialist transformation in the economic, political, and cultural sphere. Before I go on, however, I should like to state, although it is hardly necessary, that my proposals are neither new nor are they meant to be exhaustive or necessarily correct in detail. They are made in the belief that it is necessary to turn from a general discussion of principles to practical problems of how these principles can be realized. <clears throat> Long before political democracy was realized, the thinkers of the 18th century discussed blueprints of constitutional principles, which were to show that and how the democratic organization of the state was possible. The problem in the 20th century is to discuss ways and means to implement political democracy and to transform it into a truly human society. The objections which are made are largely based on pessimism and on a profound lack of faith. It is claimed that the advance of managerial society and the implied manipulation of man cannot be checked unless we regress to the spinning wheel because modern industry needs managers and automatons. Other objections are due to a lack of imagination. Still others to the deep-seated fear of being free from commands and given full freedom to live. Yet it is quite beyond doubt that the problems of social transformation are not as difficult to solve, theoretically and practically, <clears throat> as the technical problems our chemists and physicists, physicists have solved. And it can also not be doubted that we are more in need of a human renaissance than we are in need of airplanes and television. Even a fraction of the reason and practical sense used in the natural sciences applied to human problems will permit the continuation of the task our ancestors of the 18th century were so proud of. <coughs> B. The Principle of Communitarian Socialism The Marxist emphasis on socialization of the means of production was influenced in itself by 19th century capitalism. Ownership and property rights were the central categories of capitalist economy, and Marx remained within this frame of reference when he defined socialism by reversing the capitalist property system, demanding the expropriation of the expropriators. Here, as in his orientation of political versus social factors, Marx and Engels were more influenced by the bourgeois spirit than other socialist schools of thought, which were concerned with the function of the worker and the work process with his relatedness to others in the factory, with the effect of the method of work on the character of the worker. The failure, as perhaps also the popularity, of Marxist socialism lies precisely in this bourgeois overestimation of property rights and purely economic factors. But other socialist schools of thought have been much more aware of the pitfalls inherent in Marxism and have formulated the aims of socialism much more adequately Owenists, syndicalists, anarchists, and guild socialists agreed in their main concern 
which was the social and human situation of the worker in his work and the kind of relatedness to his fellow workers. By worker, I mean here, and in the following pages, everybody who lives from his own work, without additional profits from the employment of others. The aim of all these various forms of socialism, which we may call communitarian socialism, was an industrial organization in which every working person would be an active and responsible participant, where work would be attractive and meaningful, where capital would not employ labor, but labor would employ capital. They stressed the organization of work and the social relations between men, not primarily the question of ownership. As I shall show later, there is a remarkable return to this attitude by socialists all over the world, who some decades ago considered the pure form of Marxist doctrine to be the solution of all problems. In order to give the reader a general idea of the principles of this type of communitarian socialist thought, which in spite of considerable differences is common to syndicalists, anarchists, guild socialists, and increasingly so to Marxist socialists, I quote the following formulations by Cole. He writes, Fundamentally, the old insistence on liberty is right. It was swept away because it, it thought of liberty in terms of political self-government alone. The new conception of liberty must be wider. It must include the idea of man not only as a citizen in a free state, but as a partner in an industrial commonwealth. The bureaucratic reformer, by laying all the stress upon the purely material side of life, has come to believe in a society made up of well-fed, well-housed, well-clothed machines, working for a greater machine, the state. The individualist has offered to men the alternative of starvation and slavery under the guise of liberty of action. The real liberty, which is the goal of the new socialism, will assure freedom of action and immunity from economic stress by treating man as a human being and not as a problem or a god. Political liberty by itself is, in fact, always illusory. A man who lives in economic subjection six days, if not seven a week, does not become free merely by making a cross on a ballot paper once in five years. If freedom is to mean anything to the average man, it must include industrial freedom. Until men at their work can know themselves members of a self-governing community of workers, they will remain essentially servile, whatever the political system under which they live. It is not enough to sweep away the, degra the degrading relation in which the wage slave stands to an individual employer. State socialism too leaves the worker in bondage to a tyranny that is no less galling because it is impersonal. Self-government in, in, self in industry is not merely the supplement, but the precursor of political liberty. Man is everywhere in chains, and his chains will not be broken till he feels that it is degrading to be a bondsman, whether to an individual or to a state. The disease of civilization is not so much the material poverty of the many as the decay of the spirit of freedom and self-confidence. The revolt that will change the world will spring not from the benevolence that breeds reform, but from the will to be free. Men will act together in the full consciousness of their mutual dependence, but they will act for themselves. Their liberty will not be given them from above. They will take it on their own behalf. Socialists, then, must put their appeal to the workers not in the question, is it not unpleasant to be poor and will you not help to raise the poor? But in this form, poverty is but the sign of man's enslavement. To cure it, you must cease to labor for others and must believe in yourself. Wage slavery will exist as long as there is a man or an institution that is the master of men. It will be ended when the workers learn to set freedom before comfort. The average man will become a socialist not in order to secure a minimum standard of civilized life, but because he feels ashamed of the slavery that blinds him and his fellows, and because he is resolved to end the industrial system that makes them slaves. First, then, what is the nature of the ideal at which labor must aim? at which labor must aim. <clears throat> what is meant by that control of industry which the workers are to demand? It can be summed up in two words, direct management. The task of actually con conducting the business must be handed over to the workers engaged in it. To them, it must belong to order production, distribution, and exchange. They must win industrial self-government, 
with the right to elect their own officers. They must understand and control all the complicated mechanism of industry and trade. They must become the accredited agents of the community in the economic sphere. C. Socio-psychological objections. Before discussing practical suggestions for the realization of communitarian socialism in an industrial society, we had better stop and discuss some of the main objections to such possibilities. The first type of objection being based on the idea of the nature of industrial work, the other on the nature of man and the psychological motivations for work. It is precisely with regard to any change in the work situation itself that the most drastic objections to the ideas of communitarian socialism are made by many thoughtful and well-meaning observers. Modern industrial work, so the argument runs, is by its very nature mechanical, uninteresting, and alienated. It is based on an extreme degree of division of labor, and it can never occupy the interest and attention of the whole man. All ideas to make work interesting and meaningful again are really romantic dreams, and followed up with more consequence and realism, they would logically result in the demand to give up our system of industrial production and to return to the pre-industrial mode of handicraft production. On the contrary, so the argument goes on, the aim must be to make work more meaningless and more mechanized. We have witnessed, we have witnessed a tremendous reduction of working hours within the last hundred years, and a working day of four or even two hours does not seem to be a fantastic expectation for the future. Oh, that's disappointing for him. We are witnessing right now a drastic change in work methods. The work process is divided into so many small components that each worker's task becomes automatic and does not require his active attention. Thus, he can indulge in daydreams and reveries. Besides, we are using increasingly automa automatized machines, rigging with their own brains in clean, well-lit, healthy factories, and the worker does nothing but watch some instrument and pull some lever from time to time. Indeed, say the adherents of this point of view, the complete automa automatization of work is what we hope for. Man will work a few hours. It will not be uncomfortable nor require much attention. It will be an almost unconscious routine like brushing one's teeth, and the center of gravity will be the leisure hours in everybody's life. This argument sounds convincing, and who can say that the completely automatized factory and the disappearance of all dirty and uncomfortable work is not the goal which our in industrial evolution is approaching? But there are several considerations to prevent us from making the automization of work our main hope for a sane society. First of all, it is, at the least, doubtful whether the mechanization of work will have the results which are assumed in the foregoing argument. There's a good deal of evidence pointing to the contrary. Thus, for instance, a very thoughtful recent study among automobile workers shows that they disliked the job to the degree to which it, it, embed, it, oh, sorry, it embodied mass production characteristics like repetitiveness, mechanical pacing, or related characteristics. While the vast majority liked the job for economic reasons, an even greater majority disliked it for reasons of the immediate job content. The same reaction was also expressed in the behavior of the workers. Workers whose jobs had high mass production scores, that is, exhibited mass production characteristics in an extreme form, were absent more often from their jobs than workers on jobs with low mass production scores. More workers quit jobs with high mass production scores than quit jobs with low ones. It must also be questioned whether the freedom for daydreaming and reverie, which mechanized work gives, is as positive and healthy a factor as most industrial psychologists assume. Actually, daydreaming is a symptom of lacking relatedness to reality. It is not refreshing or relaxing. It is essentially an escape with all the negative results that go with escape. What the industrial psychologists, what the industrial psychologists describe in such bright colors is essentially the same lack of concentration which is so characteristic of modern man in general. You do three things at once because you do not do anything in a concentrated fashion. 
it is a great mistake to believe that doing something in a non-concentrated form is refreshing. On the contrary, any concentrated activity, whether it is work, play, or rest, rest too is an activity, is invigorating. Any non-concentrated activity is tiring. Anybody can find out the truth of this statement by a few simple self-observations. But aside from all this, it will still be many generations before such a point of automization. Automatization and reduction of working time is reached, especially if we think not only of Europe and America, but of Asia and Africa, which still have hardly started their industrial revolution. Is man during the next few hundred years to continue spending most of his energy on meaningless work, waiting for the time when work will hardly require any expenditure of energy? What will become of him in the meantime? Will he not become more and more alienated and this just as much in his leisure hours as in his working time? Is the hope for effortless work not a daydream based on the fantasy of laziness and push-button power, and rather unhealthy fantasy at that? Is not work such a fundamental part of man's existence that it cannot and should not be reduced to almost complete insignificance? Is not the mode of work in itself an essential element in forming a person's character, Does completely automatized work not lead to a completely automatized life? While all these questions are so many doubts concerning the idealization of completely automized work, we must now deal with those views which deny the possibility that work could be attractive and meaningful, hence that it could be truly humanized. The argument runs like this. Modern factory work is by its very nature not conducive to interest and satisfaction. Furthermore, there is necessary work to be done, which is positively unpleasant or repelling. Active participation of the worker in management is incompatible with the requirements of modern industry and would lead to chaos. In order to function properly in this system, man must obey, adjust himself to a routinized organization. By nature, man is lazy and not prone to be responsible. He therefore must be conditioned to function smoothly and without too much initiative and spontaneity. To deal with these arguments properly, we must indulge in some speculations on the problem of laziness and on that of the various motivations for work. It is surprising that the view of man's natural laziness can still be held by psychologists and laymen alike when so many observable facts contradict it. Laziness, far from being normal, is a symptom of mental pathology. In fact, one of the worst forms of mental suffering is boredom. Not knowing what to do with oneself and one's life, even if man had no monetary or any other reward, he would be eager to spend his energy in some meaningful way because he could not stand the boredom which inactivity produces. Let us look at children. They are never lazy, given the slightest encouragement, or even without it, they are busy playing, asking questions, inventing stories, without any incentive except the pleasure in the activity itself. In the field of psychopathology, we find that the person who has no interest in doing anything is seriously sick and is far from exhibiting the normal state of human nature. There is plenty of material about workers during periods of unemployment, who suffer as much or more from the enforced rest as from the material deprivations. There is just as much material to show that for many people, over 65, the necessity to stop working leads to profound unhappiness, and in many instances to physical deterioration and illness. Nevertheless, there are good reasons for the widespread belief in man's innate laziness. The main reason lies in the fact that alienated work is boring and unsatisfactory that a great deal of tension and hostility is engendered, which leads to an aversion against the work one is doing and everything connected with it. As a result, we find a longing for laziness and for doing nothing to be the ideal of many people. Thus, people feel that their laziness is the natural state of mind rather than the symptom of a pathological condition of life. The result of meaningless and alienated work. 
Examining the current views on work motivation, it becomes evident that they are based on the concept of alienated work, and hence that their conclusions do not apply to non-alienated, attractive work. The conventional and most common theory is that money is the main incentive for work. This answer can have two different meanings. First, that fear of starvation is the main incentive for work. In this case, the argument is undoubtedly true. Many types of work would never be accepted on the basis of wages or other work conditions, were the worker not confronted with the alternative of accepting these conditions, or of starvation. The unpleasant, lowly work in our society is done not voluntarily, but because the need to make a living forces so many people to do it. More often, the concept of money incentive refers to the wish to earn more money as the motivation to greater effort in working. If man were not lured by the hope of greater monetary reward, this argument says he would not work at all, or at least would work without interest. This conviction still exists among the majority of industrialists, as well as among many union leaders. Thus, for instance, 50 manufacturing executives replied to the question as to what is of importance and increasing workers' productivity as follows. Money alone is the answer, 44%. Money is by far the chief thing, but some importance is to be attached to less tangible things, 28%. Money is important, but beyond a certain point, it will not produce results, 28%. <clears throat> Actually, Employers throughout the world are in favor of wage incentive plans as the only means which would lead to higher productivity of the individual worker, to higher earnings for the workers and employers, and thus indirectly to reduced absenteeism, easier supervision, and so on. Reports and surveys from industry and government bureaus generally attest to the effectiveness of wage incentive plans in increasing productivity and achieving other objectives. <clears throat> It seems that workers also believe that incentive pay gets the most output per man. In a survey conducted by the Opinion Research Corporation in 1949 involving 1,021 manual workers comprising a national sample of employees of manufacturing companies, 65% said that incentive pay increases output, and only 22% that hourly pay makes for higher production. However, as to the question of which method of pay they prefer, 65% answered, <clears throat> answered hourly pay, <coughs> and only 29% were in favor of incentive pay. The ratio of preference for hourly pay was 74 to 20 in the case of hourly workers, but even in the case of workers already on incentive pay, 59%, were in favor of hourly pay as against 36% in favor of incentive pay. The latter findings are interpreted by Vitellis as showing that as, as useful as incentive pay is in raising output, it does not in itself solve the problem of obtaining workers' cooperation. In some circumstances, it may intensify that problem. This opinion is shared increasingly by industrial psychologists and even some industrialists. However, the discussion about money incentives would be incomplete if we did not consider the fact that the wish for more money is constantly fostered by the same industry which relies on money as the main incentive for work. By advertising installment, by advertising installment plan systems and many other devices, the individual's greed to buy more and newer things is stimulated to the, to the point that he can rarely have enough money to satisfy these needs. Thus, being artificially stimulated by industry, the monetary incentive plays a greater role than it otherwise would. Furthermore, it goes without saying that the monetary incentive must play a paramount role as long as it is the only incentive because the work process in itself is unsatisfactory and boring. There are many examples of cases in which people choose work with less monetary reward, if the work itself is more interesting. Aside from money, prestige, status, and the power that goes with it are assumed to be the main incentives for work. There is no need to prove that the craving for prestige and power constitutes the most powerful incentive for work today among the middle and upper classes. 
In fact, the importance of money is largely that of representing prestige, at least as much as security and comfort. But the role which the need for prestige plays also among workers, clerks, and the lower echelons of the industrial and business bureaucracy is often ignored. The nameplate of the Pullman porter, the bank teller, etc., are significant psychological boosts to his sense of importance, as are the personal telephone. Um, okay, sorry. The nameplate of the Pullman porter, the bank teller, etc., are significant psychological boosts to a sense of importance, as are the personal telephone, large office space for the higher ranks. These prestige factors play a role also among industrial workers. Money, prestige, and power are the main incentives today for the largest sector of our population, that which is employed. But there are other motivations, the satisfaction in building an independent economic existence and the performance of skilled work, both of which made work much more meaningful and attractive than it is under the motivation of money and power. But, but, but while economic independence and skill were important satisfactions for the independent businessman, artisan, and the highly skilled worker in the 19th and beginning of the 20th century, the role of these motivations is now rapidly decreasing. As to the increase of employed in contrast to independence, we note that in the beginning of the 19th century, more or less four-fifths of the occupied population were self-employed entrepreneurs. Around 1870, only one-third belonged to this group, and by 1940, this old middle class comprises only one-fifth of the occupied population. Um... I lost my spot. This shift from independent to employees or independence to employees is in itself conducive to inc- to decreasing work satisfaction for the reasons which have already been discussed. <clears throat> the employed person, more than the independent one, works in an alienated position, whether he is paid a lower or a higher salary. He is an accessory to the organization rather than a human being doing something for himself. There is one factor, however, which could mitigate the alienation of work, and that is the skill required in its performance. But here, too, development moves in the direction of decreasing skill requirements and hence increasing alienation. Among the office workers, there is a certain amount of skill required, but the factor of a pleasant personality able to sell himself, becomes of ever-increasing importance. Among industrial workers, the old type of all-around skilled worker loses ever more in importance compared with the semi-skilled worker. At Ford, at the end of 1948, the number of workers who could be trained in less than two weeks was 75-80% to of the whole working personnel of the plant. From a professional school with an apprentice program at Ford, only 300 men graduated each year, of which half entered other factories. In a factory making batteries in Chicago, there are among 100 mechanics who are considered as highly qualified, only 15 who have a thorough all-round technical knowledge. 45 others are skilled only in the use of one particular machine. At one of the Western Electric plants in Chicago, the average training of the workers takes from three to four weeks and up to six months for the most delicate and difficult tasks. The total personnel of 6,400 employees was composed in 1948 of about 1,000 white-collar workers, 5,000 industrial workers, and only 400 workers who could be considered skilled. In other words, less than 10% of the total personnel is technically qualified, In a big candy factory in Chicago, 90% of the workers require a training on the job, which is not longer than 48 hours. Even an industry like the Swiss watch industry, which was based on the work of highly qualified and skilled men, has changed drastically in this respect. While there are still a number of factories producing according to the traditional principle of, of craftsmanship, the great watch factories established in the canton of Solothurn, have only a small percentage of genuinely skilled workers. 
To sum up, the vast majority of the population work as employees with little skill required and with almost no chance to develop any particular talents or to show any outstanding achievements. While the managerial or professional groups have at least considerable interest in achieving something more or less personal, the vast majority sell their physical or an exceedingly small part of their intellectual capacity to an employer to be used for purposes of profit in which they have no share, for things in which they have no interest, with the only purpose of making a living, and for some chance to satisfy their consumer's greed. Dissatisfaction, apathy, boredom, lack of joy and happiness, a sense of futility and a vague feeling that life is meaningless, are the unavoidable results of this situation. This socially patterned syndrome of pathology may not be in the awareness of people. It may be covered by a frantic flight into escape activities, or by a craving for more money, power, prestige. But the weight of the latter motivations is so great only because the alienated person cannot help seeking for such compensations for his inner vacuity, not because these desires are the natural or most important incentives for work. Is there any empirical evidence that most people today are not satisfied with their work? In an attempt to answer this question, we must differentiate between what people consciously think about their satisfaction and what they feel unconsciously. It is evident from psychoanalytic experience that the sense of unhappiness and dissatisfaction can be deeply repressed. A person may consciously feel satisfied and only in his dreams. Psychosomatic illness, insomnia, and many other symptoms may be expressive of the underlying unhappiness. The tendency to repress dissatisfaction and unhappiness is strongly supported by the widespread feeling that not to be satisfied means to be a failure queer, unsuccessful, etc. Thus, for instance, the number of people who consciously think they are happily married and express this belief sincerely in answer to a questionnaire is by far greater than the number of those who are really happy in their marriage. But even the data on conscious job satisfaction are rather telling. But even the data on conscious job satisfaction are rather telling. In a study about job satisfaction on a national scale, satisfaction with and enjoyment of their job was expressed by 85% of the professionals and executives, by 64% of white-collar people, and by 41% of of the factory workers. In another study, we find a similar picture. 86% of the the professionals, 74% of the managerial, 42% of the commercial employees, 56% of the skilled and 48% of the semi-skilled workers expressed satisfaction. We find in these figures a significant discrepancy between professionals and executives on the one hand, workers and clerks on the other. Among the former, only a minority is dissatisfied. Among the latter, more than half. Regarding the total population, this means roughly that over half of the total employed population is consciously dissatisfied with their work and do not enjoy it. If we consider the unconscious dissatisfaction, the percentage would be considerably higher. Taking the 85% of satisfied professionals and executives, we would have to examine how many of them suffer from psychologically determined high blood pressure, ulcers, insomnia, nervous tension, and fatigue. Although there are no exact data on this, there can be no doubt that, considering these symptoms, the number of really satisfied persons who enjoy their work would be much smaller than the above figures indicate. As far as factory workers and office worker, office clerks are concerned, even the percentage of consciously dissatisfied people is remarkably high. Undoubtedly, the number of unconsciously dissatisfied workers and clerks is much higher. This is indicated by several studies which show that neurosis and psychogenic illnesses are the main reasons for absenteeism. The estimates for the presence of neurotic symptoms among factory workers go up to about 50%. Fatigue and high labor turnover are other symptoms of dissatisfaction and resentment. The most important symptom from the economic standpoint, hence the best studied one, is the widespread tendency of factory workers not to give their best to the work, or work restriction as it is often called. In a poll conducted by the Opinion Research Corporation in 
49% of all the manual workers questioned answers that when a man takes a job in a factory, he should turn out as much as he can. But 41% answered that he should not do his best, but only turn out the average amount. We see that there is a great deal of conscious and even more unconscious dissatisfaction with the kind of work uh, which our industrial society offers most of its members. One tries to counteract their dissatisfaction by a mixture of monetary and prestige incentives, and undoubtedly these incentives produce considerable eagerness to work, especially in the middle and higher echelons of the business hierarchy. But it is one thing that these incentives make people work, and it is quite another thing whether the mode of this work is conducive to mental health and happiness. The discussion on motivation of work usually considers only the first problem, namely whether this or that incentive increases the economic productivity of the worker, but not the second, that of his human productivity. One ignores the fact that there are many incentives which can make a person do something, but which at the same time are detrimental to his personality. A person can work hard out of fear or out of an inner sense of guilt. Psychopathology gives us many examples of neurotic motives leading to overactivity as well as to inactivity. Most of us assume that the kind of work current in our society, namely alienated work, is the only kind there is. Hence that aversion to work is natural. Hence that money and prestige and power are the only incentives for work. If we would use our imagination just a little bit, we could collect a good deal of evidence from our own lives, from, from observing children, from a number of situations which we can hardly fail to encounter, to convince us that we long to spend our energy on something meaningful, that we feel refreshed if we can do so, and that we are quite willing to accept rational authority if what we are doing makes sense. But even if this is true, most people object. What help is this truth to us? Industrial mechanized work cannot, by its very nature, be meaningful. It cannot give any pleasure or satisfaction. There are no ways of changing these facts unless we want to give up our technical achievements. In order to answer this objection and proceed to discuss some ideas on how modern work could be meaningful, I want to point out two different aspects of work which it is very important to discern for our problem, the difference between the technical and the social aspects of work.